Jeff Curry here. I'm just welcoming you to the RAIN CPD opportunity. Uh, this free webinar is brought to you by United Imaging. We couldn't offer these um, free opportunities um, for you to collect your CPD and come together as a group without the generous support of our sponsors. So I really do want to appreciate and recognize uh, United Imaging, um, in particular Jeff Martin, um, for his contribution to, um, to helping RAIN's members um, as well as the broader community in maintaining their CPD and continuing education um, despite the challenges of COVID-19. We're fortunate to be able to um, bring you um, Professor Simon Cherry. Um, Simon um, has a long history in nuclear medicine, but he's um, uh, obviously contributed to uh, the physics in nuclear medicine textbook that many of us will be aware of. Uh, but importantly, is that um, he's been driving the development of the total body PET scanner um, that uh, we're all um, excited about, um, the opportunities that it presents. Um, so uh, without um, further delay, um, we pass on to, um, to Simon uh, for his presentation. Um, and again, uh, as I say, thanks Simon for his time. Good evening, and it's a real pleasure to have the opportunity to talk to you uh, today about some of the developments in total body positron emission tomography. And I'll talk a bit um, about both the technology and the application. So thank you very much for the invitation to present to you. And I'm sorry I can't be with you in person. The time difference just makes it very hard. And unfortunately, I have another talk to give um, on Tuesday as well. So. Um, just wasn't possible uh, to do both at uh, both ends of the day, so I apologize for that. First of all, here are the disclosures for my presentation. And I'd like to start my presentation today by mourning the passing this uh, past weekend of Dr. Sam Gambia, who really has been one of the giants in the field of molecular imaging and also was a good friend of mine. Uh, we had adjacent offices for a while at UCLA and was very strongly influenced by, by Sam's just uh, incredible enthusiasm, innovation, and he's going to be, uh, it's going to be just a huge loss um, for the field. And so I'd like to dedicate my presentation today to Dr. Sam Gambia. So if we look across the spectrum of, of commercial PET systems that are available today, we, we have this incredible technology developed by talented engineers in, in many different companies and these hybrid imaging systems combining PET with CT or MR that just produce just astounding quality images if we, if we compare the evolution of the technology over the last uh, 20 years or so. And so it's tempting, I think, to believe that this technology has, uh, has reached a certain level of maturity where we're not going to see further big advances. But one of my jobs tonight is to persuade you that that's not the case, that we are now um, on the cusp of a new step change in performance enabled by the development of some very high sensitivity total body devices. And the opportunity comes from both the way that we collect our data and the way that we most commonly use our data. So of course, the most common clinical indication for PET is in oncology for surveying most of the body and looking for a metastasis. And so the way we collect our signal is that uh, we step our subject through the scanner and acquire data at a number of different bed positions in order to build up a picture of the whole body. And so while it's true that PET is uh, the most sensitive method we have to do non-invasive molecular assays of the human body, we also know that our images are pretty noisy and that we're often limited by the amount of radiation that we can inject. And although we boast about PET being very sensitive, it's actually fairly easy to show that our current scanners collect less than 1% of the emitted signal coming out of the human body. And that's in part because only one eighth or so of the body is actually inside the field of view of the scanner at any one moment in time. Our scanners typically cover somewhere between 20 to 30 centimeters of the body at once. And then even for the part of the scanner that is inside the body, 
only a fraction of the radiation is captured. A lot of the radiation, which is emitted isotropically, escapes out the ends of the scanner. So we do a, a, a pretty miserable job, actually, collecting the available signal, and surely we can do much better. And this is the point of total body PET, which is to uh, take today's scanner geometries that look something like this and extend them so that we have detectors that really cover the entire human body. And by doing this, we can capture far more of the emitted signal than current systems do. And that was the goal of the Explorer Consortium when we set it up quite a few years ago now, was to uh, find um, the funding and design the world's first total body imaging system. Now that comes with some challenges. Um, you know, this idea of enclosing the whole body in detectors is, 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 is a fairly straightforward idea and, and many people have had this thought over the years. But some of the challenges are that the system gets very large. Um, on the order of uh, half a million or so detectors, 50,000 or so at least channels of electronics, all of which have to be a highly time synchronized for time of flight PET. Um, and the scale of the system starts to approach the scale of, of some of the high energy physics experiments at CERN, for example, just to give you some sense. Um, the amount of data that such a system would produce, very large. So for a, for a five minute or so static acquisition, we can be easily collecting 100 gigabytes of raw data. And if we were to do a dynamic acquisition over about an hour, we'd typically be seeing one to two terabytes of raw data. And of course, the other major challenge um, that one has to consider is that by putting a lot more detectors and electronics into the system to cover the whole body, we will inevitably uh, greatly increase the cost of the system as well. But the development here is really driven by the scientific and clinical opportunities. And so the first thing we did prior to having any funding to actually construct the system was to actually run detailed Monte Carlo simulations to try and predict what a system like this would actually be able to do and what kind of sensitivity gain we would get in different situations. So if we consider imaging the entire adult uh, human body, we predicted through these simulations that the gain in effective sensitivity or signal would be about a factor of 40. That is for the same injected dose, same imaging time, we would collect roughly 40 times more events. So that's a very, very large increase in signal that we have to work with. Now in the pediatric imaging case, because kids are going to be shorter than an adult, um, the gain is somewhat less, it's about a factor of 20. And if you only want to image a single organ, such as the heart or the brain, which of course already fits in the field of view of our current systems, the gain is significantly reduced, but it's still fairly significant. Uh, it's still a gain of about a factor of five, and that's because we're capturing many more of the emitted events um, even for single organs. So let's pause for a moment to think what we can do if we have 40 times more signal impact. How could we use that? And, and we have a number of, of, of quite appealing options to us. So first of all, of course, we can get much better quality images. We collect a lot more signal. Um, and so the signal to noise ratio goes roughly as the square root of the signal. And so we could anticipate having images with an a signal to noise ratio that's improved by about a factor of six and a half, which means that we're going to have lower noise in our images, better quality images. We can expect that we can detect smaller lesions, or we can see features that have lower uptake, lower grade disease. Another appealing opportunity is that because we're detecting 40 times more signal, we can follow our radio traces for longer before the signal starts to disappear into the noise. So we can acquire our images for roughly five more half-lives than on a conventional scanner, which means that with carbon 11, for example, we can now image out well beyond uh, three hours. The third possibility is that we can scan much more quickly. If we can acquire 40 times more signal, that means we could acquire a scan potentially in 1 40th of the time that we currently take. So instead of taking 20 minutes to acquire a total body scan, which is uh, uh, currently a, a typical scan length, we could acquire that scan now in just 30 seconds, which means you've got much less motion to deal with. And it also opens up the possibility of acquiring a whole body PET scan in a single breath hold. And the last possibility is that we could reduce the injected dose by a factor of 40. 
So it would be possible to acquire a total body PET scan at an effective dose of about 0.15 millisieverts. And that's roughly the radiation dose you get from a round trip transatlantic flight. And another consequence of this, if we want to follow uh, chronic disease in an individual, for example, is that we can now do 40 scans in an individual for the same dose as they currently receive in one scan. Now we can't do all these things at the same time, so we have to choose one of these or some more modest combination of these possibilities, but it opens up a whole new parameter space in PET for how we collect our data in terms of the injected dose, the time we take to collect the data, and the signal to noise we have in the final images. So this is very attractive and there are a number of applications that would greatly benefit from this potential increase in sensitivity. Obviously, a system that covers the whole body is ideally designed for looking at systemic disease and systemic therapy. So cancer, of course, is the poster child application uh, for PET and we'll continue to see wide use of PET. But now perhaps we can push into what I'll call ultra staging, where we can see smaller deposits of, of disease, even perhaps being able to um, sense the presence of micrometastases, not directly visualize them because they're too small, but perhaps through changes in the uptake and the kinetics, we might be able to determine their presence. Any paradigm we use in cancer can also be used um, in inflammation and infection, which have also uh, systemic diseases, and, and there's a lot of interesting new traces being developed in this space. Cellular therapy is also a major area of interest. And then a growing appreciation that many diseases and disorders involve multiple organ systems and are not just the domain of one organ um, within the body. And also interactions, of course, between organ systems and the immune system and the microbiome. So there's a lot of interest in, in mind-body interactions, multi-systems interactions, and the ability to image kinetically our radio traces in every tissue and organ of the body should open up some interesting new opportunities in research and perhaps eventually in clinical practice. Another whole area where a total body scanner would be very useful is in total body pharmacokinetics. So new therapeutic agents, uh, for example, new drugs can be tracked their concentration can be measured in every tissue and organ of the body over time with a total body scanner. Toxicological research, where we can use very tiny, tiny doses of potentially toxic agents and follow their distribution in vivo. And of course, in our own field, to help develop and characterize new radio traces as biomarkers. And then the last major category of application is where we can take advantage of being able to do PET scans at extremely low doses. So an expanded use of PET, perhaps in the pediatric and adolescent population, our ability to use repeated PET scans to follow the trajectory of a chronic disease and multiple interventions over, over a period of many months and years. And then also using PET more frequently to study normal biology. The fact that we can do these studies now at very low doses opens up the possibility of using PET much more frequently to understand uh, normal human biology. So these are some of the applications that we think merit the development of these total body systems. But of course, as I mentioned earlier on, the cost is a, is a major potential barrier, certainly uh, in people's perception of the value of developing these systems. And we struggled for many, many years to obtain funding to build the first prototype dating back all the way to February 2008. You can get a sense from the small font size here, this is going to be a long list, but I just want to give you a sense of of the struggles we went through um, in persuading uh, the community over time that this was worth doing. So we started out with a proposal to NIH in 2008, that did not do well. We went back with a modified proposal later in the year. Um, and so we got the cost argument back from the reviewers. Um, here's one of the, the um, uh, quotes from the review, which said that at such a high cost, a large axial field of view PET scanner is certainly not economically feasible as a clinical scanner and does not even appear feasible as a research scanner. So that was dead in the water. We then went to the Keck Foundation, which is known to fund fairly high risk uh, projects, but this was too high risk for them. They didn't like it. We then went to the National Science Foundation in the United States under what's called a major research instrumentation initiative that went down in flames as well back to NIH in 2011 with a small scale proposal. Um, and this actually did get some initial funding for the project and allowed us to um, develop some of the ideas and run those computer simulations that I showed you um, a few moments ago. 
We also got some internal uh, funding from our university that was supporting the development of large multidisciplinary projects at the time. So those two sources of funding really helped us to develop some of the conceptual uh, data that we needed then uh, to push forwards. Um, also at that time, Siemens donated uh, a lot of old equipment to us um, from uh, one of their uh, clinical prototype scanners that allowed us to build a small scale version that we actually used for some preclinical studies in non-human primates. So we were on a roll at that time. But then when we went back to NIH in 2014 to actually try and get enough funding to build um, a human total body system, uh, we again ran into those uh, same barriers, a lot of concerns about costs and applications. We went back to the Keck Foundation again. We then went overseas. We went to the Medical Research Council and the Wellcome Trust in the United Kingdom. We actually got very close to getting funded there, but we uh, failed again at the very last hurdle there. And then finally, in October 2014, we submitted a large transformative research grant to the National Institutes of Health um, in uh, the United States. And this is the one um, that finally got funded. And there we are celebrating with a cake. And uh, that's really kicked off in September 2015, uh, the development of building the first total body scanner. So, um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time going over the development that took place over the last uh, five years. I will just give a little brief description of the technology. So um, inside the Explorer system, uh, we have uh, detector modules that consist of these arrays of LYSO crystals, uh, about 2.76 millimeters on a side. And that small dimension is what's going to give us a very high uh, spatial resolution. And these are constructed into seven by six arrays and then read out by four silicon uh, photomultiplier tubes that are coupled to the bottom of the crystal array. These are then built into large uh, panels, as you see here, each one covering about 24 centimeters in the uh, axial direction of the scanner along this direction. And then those are built up into the system, which will be shown in this uh, short video here. So um, here you see one of the panels being built up from one of the crystal arrays. And now the crystal array built into one of the panels that extends 24 centimeters in the axial field of view um, in this direction. That then goes into one ring, which we call a unit. Then there are eight of those units replicated to cover an axial field of view of just under two meters. And then we have a high-end CT scanner on the front of the system. So this is a combined PET-CT system. And this is the Explorer total body scanner. So, Scanner construction actually proceeded very quickly. Um, the first PET unit was built in uh, December of 2017. Uh, by January of 2018, the second unit was built. By February, we were up to five units. And by May 2018, the full system was constructed. And this uh, construction was uh, done in collaboration with United Imaging Healthcare. Uh, they are our industry partner for this project and uh, they were the company that did all the manufacturing and fabrication of the system and has now made the system uh, commercially available. So here's just a few pieces of information about the scanner. So uh, we have just over half a million individual crystals in the system, uh, about 54,000 silicon photomultipliers, and in total we measure 92 billion different lines of response through the human body when we're acquiring a data set. The system is actually quite roomy, so the ring diameter is uh, just under 79 uh, centimeters. The opening at the front of the scanner is um, about 70 centimeters. We've not had any issues with claustrophobia in the system uh, to date. Um, and the real uh, distinguishing factor is this axial field of view here of 194.8 centimeters, which is long enough to cover almost the entire adult population in terms of fitting the whole body in the field of view. And then, as I mentioned, we have an 80 detector OCT scanner on the front. And it is a time of flight capable system. Uh, the time of flight resolution on this system is about 508 picoseconds. So, 
of course, when you uh, first build a system, the first thing you do are phantom studies. And as a medical physicist, I'm very used to doing phantom studies, uh, things like this, where you have small cylinders and you fill them with a radioactive solution, usually with a syringe. But as soon as we started working with the Explorer scanner, we realized everything's on a different scale. You suddenly have to be working with much, much larger phantoms. So if you want to, for example, characterize the axial uniformity of the system, um, here's a phantom that uh, was developed and that covers the whole two meter axial field of view of the system. And uh, here I am uh, with uh, my close uh, colleague, collaborator and friend, Ramsey Badawi, who has co-directed this project with me um, throughout. And in the background, some of you may know this gentleman, this is Dr. Terry Jones, one of the pioneers of PET and a long-term advisor to this project. Fitting the phantoms is not easy either. Um, in order to get well-mixed activity, you need to, to pre-mix the activity first before fitting the phantom and the volume and weight is such that we actually have to use a small forklift here in order to fill the phantom, as you can see. So just everything gets a bit more complicated when you have a scanner on this kind of scale. So here's actually one of the very first acquisitions that came off the scanner, which was of that uniform pipe phantom that you just saw. Here's 150 megabeck rails diluted into 35 liters in that phantom in a five minute acquisition and very gratifying to see right at the very first images coming off a uh, very good uniform um, uh, activity uh, along the phantom and the reconstructions here. And you can see a few normalization artifacts if you look. And of course, at the very ends of the scanner, the signal noise is not nearly as good um, as you expect in a 3D PET scanner. But overall, a very pleasing result. And we continue to image the phantom as it decayed. And even down at almost homeopathic levels of, of activity, here we are at 0.18 megabecquerels diluted in 35 liters. We can, we can still get an image uh, of this phantom. And so, this was, you know, gave us uh, good confidence that uh, the, the sensitivity that we were predicting uh, was actually there. What about spatial resolution? Well, here's a spatial resolution test. Um, and this is the standard uh, NEMA protocol. And you can see we're at about three millimeter spatial resolution at the, at the center of the field of view. Um, and for a small acceptance angle, as we open up the axial acceptance angle, <coughs> excuse me, you can see the resolution does degrade a little bit because of um, parallax errors uh, in the axial direction to about four millimeters or so. Here's a standard uh, Dorenzo phantom that we evaluated and you can see the 2.4 millimeter rods are clearly resolved, almost the two millimeter rods as well. And if we go to a more sophisticated reconstruction algorithm, something that's not clinical, clinically practical at the present time, it just takes too long, I just wanted to show you this because it does show the resolution potential that's there within the detectors. We can start to resolve the 1.6 millimeter rod. So there's still lots of work to do actually in optimizing the image reconstruction uh, to make it tractable to do these high resolution reconstructions in a reasonable uh, time. Now, of course, the real uh, selling point of Total Body Pet is the sensitivity. And so here is the standard uh, NEMA NU2 protocol for measuring sensitivity. It's based on a 70 centimeter line source, which usually is plenty to cover the whole field of view of any other scanner, but of course only covers part of our field of view. And with this line source, we get a value of about 174,000 counts per second per megabecquerel. And if you compare that with the same measurement done on, on, on standard industry standard systems, those are about 10 to 20,000 counts per second per megabecker. So you see the massive improvement in sensitivity, which we, of course, would anticipate. That difference becomes even larger if we go to an extended line source, a line source that actually covers the length of the human body. The average human is about 165 to 170 centimeters long. So if we have a line source of that length, we put it in the scanner, we get a result of 147,000 counts per second per megabecquerel. And if you were to do that experiment on an industry standard uh, PET-CT or PET-MR scanner, you'd be in the range of four to eight or so. And so this is where this very, very large factor improvement in sensitivity comes from having this large axial field of view. Now, an unexpected challenge in this project um, was that at the time we had finished building the system and had completing testing on the system in Shanghai where it was constructed and we were about to ship it to the United States, Donald Trump decided to slap uh, tariffs on all medical imaging equipment and many other things besides. 
And so we were suddenly faced with an additional two and a half million dollar in cost, which was not in our grant, uh, to bring the system in and pay the tariff. Fortunately, there was an exemption process. It was much like writing a, a grant proposal, only a much drier material. And uh, so we wrote this very long document arguing why um, we should not have to pay this 25% tariff. And it took the federal government a year, but after a year, they did actually agree with us. And although by then we'd actually paid the tariff in the hope that we would get it back, we did in fact get a refund check from the federal government for that tariff. And here is the system uh, installed. Um, you can also see it uh, behind me here. Here it is installed in its new home at UC Davis. Um, and so just to remind you the key performance factors, uh, the sensitivity, which is extremely, extremely high, uh, very good spatial resolution for a clinical pet system as well. Time of flight resolution is, is now not as good as some of the other systems that are out there. Um, there are some systems now approaching 200 picoseconds. And of course, we would love to see a total body scanner with that level of time of flight. But remember here, we, <clears throat> we have over half a million crystals in coincidence with each other. So to maintain timing at the level of a few hundred picoseconds across this incredibly large volume and very large number of crystals is actually quite an accomplishment. And the energy resolution of the system is also pretty good at just under 12%. All right, but what of course we care about is, you know, what can we do with, with, with the scanner? And here's our first uh, human study uh, done June 20th, 2019. So, so just over a year ago at UC Davis. Um, and uh, this was a very exciting moment for us. This is a FDG study, pretty standard injection of about 350 megabecquerels. And I'll show you the results from a 20 minute scan started 90 minutes post injection. And uh, I think you can already appreciate just the amazing image quality here. Um, for example, you can very clearly uh, see the vessels uh, in, in, in the leg here, very nice detail. Another thing I like, like to point out is the incredibly high uniformity of the liver here, which I think gives you an indication of just how good uh, the signal to noise ratio is. That's a maximum intensity projection. If we, if we go in now and look at some of the actual slices uh, through the body here, for example, we're looking at the chambers of the heart very nicely uh, delineated, the aortic arch up here, and then the descending uh, aorta. You see that very clearly here. We can identify some of the muscle groups in the leg very nicely here. Uh, there's some inflammation in the knee joint here. Um, probably indicative of a little bit of arthritis in this uh, individual who was uh, 79 years old. So I think this gives you some sense of the image quality in, in a fairly standard um, acquisition protocol. A um, little bit of a word about data handling. This is one of the challenges. We have a, a, you know, quite a lot of computational power thrown at this data. So we have uh, eight reconstruction nodes here, each of which contains two high-end uh, GPUs with quite a bit of memory on as well and uh, CPUs. And using you know, this configuration of these eight nodes all running in parallel, it uh, takes us um, on the order of about 10 to 15 minutes to reconstruct our typical clinical scans. And for our dynamic research scans, it typically takes several hours, depending on how many frames we're trying to reconstruct. So these are, these are manageable times, but there's still times that we would like to improve further. And so quite a bit of work is still going on to um, improve that computational uh, network um, and architecture to speed up the reconstruction times. <clears throat> so let's go back now to our claims. We made a number of claims based on simulations about how we can improve signal to noise ratio, increase our dynamic range, image quickly, and image at low dose. And now I'd like to show you um, some examples to support that. So first of all, looking at higher signal to noise ratio. So uh, here again, we have a pretty standard FDG scan, about eight millicuries, 290 megabecquerels injected, 20 minute scan, about eight minutes post injection. And so here's the, the Explorer scan sitting in the middle here. This is uh, a single uh, 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 slice um, through, through the body. Um, actually, it's a maximum intensity projection of several slices, I apologize. Um, and then on the left-hand side is a conventional PET-CT scanner. It's United Imaging's uh, UMI 780. So it's, it's a pretty high sensitivity uh, uh, scanner itself with a 30 centimeter axial field of view. 
Um, and this is reconstructed with a pretty standard clinical protocol. On the right is the same data set from the conventional scanner, but reconstructed on a voxel size that matches what we used on the Explorer to try and match the spatial resolution as well, to make sure we weren't doing an un unfair comparison. So this is Explorer data set. This is the conventional scanner reconstructed two different ways, one, one at high resolution, one with the standard protocol. And I wanna draw your attention to two features um, in these images. The first one is down here. So here we see a little focal area of uptake, which is really hard to discern, in fact, impossible, I would say, to discern on the conventional scanner, how you reconstruct the data. So this is where having the improved signal to noise ratio is going to help us to see small focal deposits of our radio tracer. And as a contrary um, example, up in the liver here on the conventional scanner, you, you see a little hotspot that could potentially be, be suspicious. And you know, in the noisy environment here of this liver, you're not sure whether that's true focal uptake or it's just noise. On the high resolution reconstruction, really hard to see. Um, on the Explorer scan, where we have this beautifully uniform background in the liver because we have such high signal to noise ratio, we can really clearly see that this is not um, any area of focal uptake, this was just a case of noise on the conventional scanner. So we just have a, a, a better ability to distinguish true signal from noise because we have much higher signal to noise ratio in our images. As I mentioned, we also have the ability to image any of our radio traces out longer in time. So this is FDG again, uh, now imaged out to 12 hours post injection. So Here's the scan at one and a half hours. Um, this is actually the scan that you saw uh, previously. Um, but now imaging out at three hours, six hours, you can see that the blood activity is clearing, increasingly clearing over time. Uh, and so we're getting better and better contrast over time. Um, and then when we get to um, 12 hours, um, you, you, although you know, the images are getting a lot more noisy here, you can still get very acceptable total body images um, even with very, very tiny amounts of activity left in the body, six half-lives after administration. Now, here's an example of fast imaging. So um, again, this is the same subject I've shown a couple of times now with uh, 350 megabecker on injection with FDG, 90 minutes post-injection. This is the 20-minute scan where we have really beautiful quality images. If we take just one minute of that data, um, this is the image we get. So it's, it's obviously noticeably worse because we have uh, far fewer statistics contributing to the data set. But as a whole body PET scan goes, this is certainly a very reasonable quality scan. And even at 30 seconds, um, we can get qu uh, scans that really match the quality that we have been getting in the clinic on our regular scanners using somewhere between 10 and 25 minute data acquisition. So the ability to scan the entire body in 30 seconds and get reasonable quality images is certainly there. And those were maximum intensity projections. Now here I'm showing an individual coronal slice, just because then you can see the noise levels a little better by examining the liver here, for example. And here's an example of low dose imaging. So now we're at 1 18th of the standard dose. This is just 20 megabecquerels injected into this uh, normal volunteer here. And this is quite a large subject. So this is a subject that's almost two meters tall, weighs just over a hundred kilos. So we've got a little bit of activity distributed in, in a pretty large volume here. And still really, really nice quality images in this 20 minute scan. And again, here are some of the individual cross sections through the brain and through the level of the heart here as well at these very, very low doses. So, all of those examples are really showing you that we can do standard FDG imaging you know, uh, uh, faster or at much lower dose than we've been able to do before. But this example I'm about to show you this movie is something that we've never been able to do. And this is really, I think, you know, the, the strength of the Explorer total body system is the ability to acquire the dynamics of the tracer distribution across the whole body over time. So in this movie, what you're gonna see is we're gonna inject FDG into a, a leg vein in this case, and you're gonna watch that bolus of FDG move uh, through the body <clears throat> into the heart. And um, here we go, here goes the bolus injection. 
up into the heart, distributes to the lungs, back to the left ventricle, and then through the arterial phase out to all the major organs. And um, as time progresses, time is on the top here. Um, at about three minutes, you're gonna see the kidneys light up here and excrete into the bladder, so we can watch that process dynamically. And then as time continues on now, we start to see the, the, um, the standard distribution of FDG in the brain and the heart and uh, in the liver. So we're now able to create these movies watching the pharmacokinetics of our radio tracers across the entire body. And that is just something that was never possible with conventional scanners because you can only see a portion of the body at any one time. And of course, we can take that further because we can extract quantitative time activity curves from every single organ in the body. And of course, we always get the blood input function as well because we always have the blood pool, for example, from the left ventricle or perhaps better still from the aortic arch or the descending aorta where you don't have any spillover effects. We can measure the <clears throat> activity of the radio tracer in the blood over time um, for the whole body. And we can also, of course, uh, look at the bolus and measure when it reaches each of the organs. So we can also measure the delay. And then um, we can combine all this information eventually uh, with our kinetic models. And so th this is just showing the, um, the arterial phase of the tracer. These are one second frames, uh, two seconds apart, showing that we can nicely watch the delivery of the tracer to different organs. We can measure the arrival time of the bolus in each of the major arteries here. So we know when the bolus arrives at a particular organ. And so we know both the activity concentration, the function of time and the delay for every organ and tissue in the body. We can combine that with our tracer kinetic models. And now we can create parametric maps of parameters of interest across the whole body. In this case, <clears throat> a fairly simple parameter we're looking at is Ki, the FDG influx rate constant which is K1, K3 over K2 plus K3 from the standard uh, two to two uh, compartment model for FDG. And here in these images, we have computed the value of Ki for every voxel inside the human body using a dynamic data set. And so these are in values of mils per minute per gram, quantitative values across the whole body. So this total body parametric imaging, I think is gonna be a very powerful tool um, in research. And here's an example of doing that in a cancer patient. So this is a patient with metastatic uh, kidney cancer. This study is courtesy of Dr. Guel Wang at our institution. These are some individual dynamic frames from that data set. So this is again FDG. So this is um, from about 30 seconds to a minute post injection. So here you're primarily looking at perfusion, the vascular phase. You can see a lot of lesions already showing up due to their high perfusion here. Uh, and then as we go out later in time, you know, here at 55 to 60 minutes is the more standard sort of SUV type uh, image that we get with FDG. But here, of course, we're going to throw all of this into our parametric uh, um, here model. You have three parametric maps. You have the influx rate uh, constant again. Of FDG. Sorry about that. This seems to have a voiceover on it. Fractional blood volume in the middle, VB. And on the right, you have one of the microparameters, K1, which is the glucose transport rate. And you can see how you, for these parametric maps, we can extract different information using the time series of images. So here, here's another example where we've been using FDG imaging in a research application, which uh, I think is a good use for the total body scanner. So this is in arthritis. So again, a systemic disease involving many joints in the body where the ability to do Kinetic studies across the whole body is very valuable. So we've got three different types of arthritis in, in, in this study. This is courtesy of Yasser Abdelhafez and Abhijit Chowdhury at our institution. So we've got uh, psori psoriatic arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and osteoarthritis um, in these three panels. And we have an ongoing study to look at the differences in the uptake patterns of these three different types of arthritis. And the spatial resolution here is really nice. We can, we can look at the joints here, we can even see uh, arthritis in, for example, the big toe, in this particular case of rheumatoid uh, arthritis here. And again, uh, in, in this case here, we've got um, some uptake in one of the knee joints uh, that we can very uh, clearly see, um, as well as again down in one of the toes um, here, where we very clearly see the inflammatory FDG 
um, response. So a combination here of high sensitivity, total body coverage, high spatial resolution, really makes this a very nice tool for studying arthritis. Now, in this application, we're switching to a different trace from one where dose really matters. So this is a zirconium-89 labeled antibody that's directed um, against um, one of the envelope coat proteins on HIV. So this is a tracer developed by Henry Van Brocklin and his collaborators at UCSF. And um, in this individual, we injected 0.9 millicuries of this zirconium labeled antibody. The images I'm showing are 48 hours post-injection. So we've got a, uh, just under 0.6 millicuries left in the body. I'd point out that the positron emission fraction of zirconium 89 is only 23%. So therefore, the actual number of positron emissions here is about equivalent to one hundredth of the normal sort of 370 mega macro dose of FDG that one might give. So we're dealing with a very, very small signal that we're trying to image here. And as some of you will know, the dosimetry for zirconium-89 is not particularly favorable. So it's really important that we can do these studies at low injected doses. Here you see the Explorer scan of one of our HIV uh, patients. Um, and it's not bad, it's not as good as the FDG scans that I've shown you previously, of course, but um, here, again, we're dealing with a very low dose regime. But it really stands out how good the signal to noise is when we compare that with the same individual that was scanned just um, a few hours earlier on a conventional PET-MR scanner. Um, and this is you know, a very high sensitivity, sensitivity system. This was a 48 minute scan, so more than twice the length of the Explorer scan, only covered part of the body. And you can see how much more noisy um, this image is uh, compared to this image. For example, if you look at the details up in the, the head and neck region here, which are almost um, invisible in the case of the study on the conventional scanner. So this study really does highlight the advantages for these low dose studies of having uh, the total body scanner with a very, very high sensitivity. Now, let me talk a bit about some of the research we've been doing to push the temporal resolution even further. So, you know, I've already shown you scans, FDG scans, that's sort of like 30 seconds or so. You can even go down to 10 seconds. Um, that looks pretty nice. But what about pushing it even further? Well, in the earlier, early vascular phase, we have really good contrast, and so even one second images look pretty good. And here we're pushing it even to one hundredth of a second. So this is just a hundred millisecond acquisition. And again, we have enough signal to noise here to be able to produce a reasonably good image. If on top of that, we now employ some advanced reconstruction techniques, this is the so-called kernel EM reconstruction, that, um, uh, a group at UC Davis has published on previously, which essentially uses information in the temporal domain to help improve the signal to noise ratio. So it turns these images into images that look like this. We now can really start to work with these very, very short time frames and do some quite interesting things. So first of all, I just want to show you what happens if we look at the image derived input function, the blood activity, as we increase the temporal resolution. So here, if we take 10 second frames as we're injecting the bolus and we look at a region over uh, some of the blood vessels, for example, in the, over the left ventricular blood pool, or the ascending aorta, descending aorta, you know, we can see the bolus as it goes in, but of course our temporal sampling here, 10 seconds, doesn't really define the bolus particularly well. If we go to one second frames, now we very nicely define the bolus as it's injected. We can see the slight delay between the different vessels, different locations. We're looking at the, at the blood activity here. And you might think, well, this looks good enough. Why, why would we want to increase the temporal resolution even more? You've really defined the bolus there very nicely. But an interesting thing happens if you go down to 0.1 seconds and you look at the time activity curve, you suddenly start to see an oscillation superimposed on the data. And of course, that oscillation is the cardiac cycle. And so now we're going fast enough with our frame time, without any averaging here, that we're able to capture individual heartbeats and see that in the data. And so we can actually now construct movies um, 
at this very high resolution. So on the left is the standard sort of one second resolution movie I'd shown you before. And here's the point one second. And now watch as the right ventricle fills, you can see um, it beating, the, the activity goes out to the lungs, comes back into the heart. And now you see the left ventricle uh, beating and contracting and pumping the blood around the body. So we're actually, this is not time averaged because this is as the bolus is going in. So we are actually imaging individual heartbeats with PET with no time averaging here because we have great signal to noise and, and great contrast in these early phases, which combined with our advanced reconstruction gives us enough signal to noise to get credible images at these very short frame lengths. And of course, then we can use that information, those oscillations that we see, we can use that to self-gate the images. So we can derive cardiac gating information without any ECG or any other information just from these 100 millisecond frames themselves. So here's a region of interest place over the myocardium. You can see oscillations that come from the cardiac cycle. We can do some filtering, image, uh, signal processing to pull that out a little bit better here. By the way, on top of that, you can also see a respiratory motion here. And then we can gate that and we can create these gated images. Um, so this is EKG free gated PET images. This is actually average over eight seconds of data here. And you can actually watch the beating heart very, very nicely. So I think there's gonna be lots of fun things that we can do with this ultra fast imaging that is enabled by the very high signal to noise ratio that we have. Now we are using the Explorer scanner clinically. We've done over 300 patients uh, on, on the system uh, so far. I'm gonna show you a couple of examples. So this is a response to therapy study again with, with FDG. And so here we're looking at uh, some sclerotic lesions in um, the uh, spinal column here. This is the CT scan. This was on our conventional uh, PET CT scanner and um, it was not possible um, because of the limited spatial resolution to determine if there had been a response to therapy. On the Explorer scanner, where we can push our images to higher spatial resolution, we could clearly see a correspondence between the lesions as seen on the CT and photo deficient or FDG deficient regions on the uh, Explorer PET scan, showing that uh, these lesions are not FDG avid, which they had been previously, and therefore had responded uh, to therapy. And here's another example enabled by the very high spatial resolution. This is a through cyclamine uh, study. And so this here is a tiny pulmonary nodule that we see in the lung. It's just two and a half millimeters in size. We can see it on the CT here and we can also visualize this uptake nicely on the flu cyclamine scan as well. Now, flucyclamine turns out to be a great example of why you need a total body scan because of the protocols that are used for um, uh, imaging uh, prostate cancer patients with flucyclamine. So it's felt that since um, you're most likely to uh, have lesions in and around the prostate, that that's on a conventional scanner where you're gonna start imaging. So you start imaging at the prostate and um, uh, about three to five minutes after injecting the radio tracer. And so flucyclamine has fast kinetics. It's not like FDG where you have a nice static distribution. So you have to image quite quickly after injection. And then um, we scan the patient um, through the scanner, starting, as I said, at the pelvis and moving up through the body on a regular scanner. This is how you would collect the data over 20 to 25 minutes. So you image at the pelvis a few minutes after injection. By the time you get to the head, you're at about 20 to 25 minutes after injection. Why, why is that important? Well, of course, on, the, on our scanner, we can image the whole body all at once. So we're imaging the dynamics of the flu cyclamine distribution across the whole body. This patient, as you can see over the 20 minutes, also is moving their arms. So these are one minute frames, 21 minute frames um, over the course of, of the study. But why it's clinically important is shown here in this patient. So here we are imaging over the pelvis at four minutes, like you would be doing on a conventional scanner, and nothing remarkable is showing up, nor at six minutes either, nor at eight minutes. But now at 10 minutes, we start to see an area of focal uptake in the flu cyclamine scan. Now, remember, on a regular scanner by now, you would be imaging other parts of the body. You would no longer be imaging 
over the pelvis. So you would have missed this lesion. And if we continue imaging at 12 and a half, 14 and a half, 16 and a half, you can see we get more and more uptake in this lesion. Now, as I said, on a conventional scanner, we would have been imaging this part of the body at this time here, and we would have missed that lesion completely. And we have examples of other lesions that go the other way, that show up in the early frames and then disappear by the later frames. So flucyclovene is very much a tracer where there is a massive benefit to being able to image the whole body kinetically so that you don't miss lesions that may appear at certain time points and not at other time points. So we've come a long way. This is one of the very first um, whole body FDG scans actually done on a rectilinear scanner back in 1976. This image comes courtesy of Abbas Alavi. And of course, where we are an Explorer now where we get these really exquisite um, images of the whole human body. I want to acknowledge a vast team of people that have helped with this project from its inception. We have a fantastic team at UC Davis who have been involved in, in working with the scanner over the past uh, year or so. And I particularly want to thank um, my close colleague and friend Ramsey Badawi who co-led this project with me from the very start. The very talented team at United Imaging who um, who shared the vision and enthusiasm of this project with us and then actually executed it, uh, all the engineering and design uh, that went into the system. And it's been a remarkably successful system. As I said, over 300 subjects now, now studied at UC Davis and, and the system has worked extremely well and met all the specifications um, that we had uh, requested. And then uh, we have a fantastic uh, uh, team of, of techs and other scientists supporting the studies at the Explorer Molecular Imaging Center. And of course, none of this would have been possible without uh, the very significant support um, from the National Institutes of Health in the United States. And with that, uh, I'll finish. Um, sorry, we can't have a live question and answer session. However, if there are questions uh, that come out of the presentation, I'd be delighted to answer them by email. And so here's my email address. If you would like to contact me, uh, please feel free to do, do so. And thanks very much for listening to the presentation. And it's been a real pleasure to present to you. I'm just sorry I couldn't do it in person. Thank you.